much, much of our time at Trout Unlimited has been very focused on the biology and science um, and what the reality of, of a free flowing river would provide for both the survival and recovery of Snake River, salmon and steelhead throughout the basin. Um, and so first, um, you know, one of the perspective, perspectives, like I'm saying, is we haven't spent much time on explaining uh, the outsized recreational opportunity that the lower snake would provide um, 140 miles of new free-flowing recreational um, opportunities and economy, economic opportunities. Um, so tonight, uh, as I said, uh, we're joined by uh, uh, both industry leaders and community leaders that collectively spend more, more time um, on free-flowing rivers uh, in any given year than most people do in a lifetime. Um, and so with that, let me introduce uh, Mark Deming. Uh, Mark is the Director of Marketing with NRS, Northwest River Supply, um, in Moscow, Idaho. Um, Mark has worked for nearly 10 years at the Confluence of Commerce and Conservation. Uh, he helped transform NRS into a worldwide outdoor industry leader while marrying its brand to the fight for healthy, free-flowing rivers. Uh, beginning in 2016, he was co-founder of 5,000 Miles of Wild, which united outdoor industry brands with national nonprofits to help achieve new river protections in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. In 2019, he co-founded the Just Add Water campaign, which has brought together a coalition of brands and nonprofits to break down barriers to the outdoor among <clears throat> underrepresented groups and create new conservation advocates. He lives in Moscow, Idaho, and spends his free time exploring rivers, mountains, and deserts with his family. In addition to Mark, we have Chris St. Germain, of the Clear, uh, is the coordinator of the Clearwater County Economic Development which fosters a thriving business climate by facilitating proactive partnerships and leveraging available resources for the benefit of existing startups and new businesses countywide. It's kind of important to note that um, Clearwater County is one of nine counties in the state of Idaho that um, are either uh, have um, a portion of the Snake River Basin, specifically in Clearwater County, the Clearwater River. Um, so one of nine of those counties that uh, either um, directly benefit from the recreation um, derived from uh, either an angling economy or even a uh, jet boat economy, which is very prevalent in uh, Orofino, um, where Chris is, in addition to um, uh, just uh, the rafting economy that we see on the upper sections of Clearwater. Um, in addition to that, Chris uh, has a, a BS in biology with a focus on conservation biology that works in pretty handily in understanding the science of uh, salmonids. Um, Chris has lived in the North Central uh, Idaho since 1990. Her working life has been with the US Forest Service, the Idaho Department of Lands, the Nez Perce Tribe, and in community and economic development. So welcome, Chris. And then lastly, we have Roy Akins coming from the cab of his pickup in Riggins, Idaho, um, since the power is out in Riggins and has been since uh, 2.30 this morning. So uh, you wanna talk about devotion. Um, Roy is uh, um, the representation of, of devotion to a cause. But uh, Roy is a drift boat fishing outfitter, um, as I mentioned, um, in Riggins, Idaho, um, spends most of his time on the Salmon River through the uh, fall, winter, and spring and then uh, transitions into a uh, dory uh, oarsman on the Middle Fork. Um, Roy operates a small family business called Rapid River Outfitters in Riggins. Uh, Roy is deeply involved in his community on many levels and his services include Riggins City Council, the Salmon River Dive Team Captain, board member of the Riggins Seniors, uh, Idaho County Recycling Riggins Chapter, uh, he was a member um, with Trout Unlimited uh, of the Governor Salmon Work Group. And uh, uh, to say that uh, Roy is uh, a, a true, um, true salvation to Salmon and Steelhead would be an understatement. Uh, in 1995, Roy uh, and a couple others swam the entire length of the Salmon River um, to the confluence of the Snake down to Lower Granite Dam 
to bring uh, a level, a new level of awareness to the recent listing of sockeye salmon. And so um, I think uh, let, let's set this stage, I guess, Roy, by uh, providing th this recreational idea. So you spend a lot of days both on the middle fork and on the salmon. And so, um, you know, when we started this conversation, I guess, in the green room, um, you were talking about, um, you know, even on a poor run year this year, how many trips and, and how many guests you have already provide, provided services to this fall. So let, let, let's start there. Let, let's, let's talk about what that, that free flowing section of the Salmon River has already provided to you, just one business in the Riggins area. You know, uh, the Riggins area has, has been thriving. Outdoor recreation, obviously on a national level is booming like we've never seen. People want to be outdoors. They want to be doing healthy things with a smaller carbon footprint and drift boat fishing and whitewater recreation fit that bill perfectly right now. It really seems that people have a real draw to this area because of our free flowing salmon river, the beaches it provides, the fishing opportunity it provides, the solitude, the ability to get away from technology to be off the grid is something that we are seeing people wildly crave right now. So even on a year like this, where we get uh, reports early on in this summer that our steelhead runs are returning uh, at poor levels, we were fearful at one point that we may have no season. We were fearful maybe it would be a catch and release only season. Uh, we were able to get to a, uh, a one fish limit. Now at the first of the year, moved to a two fish limit. But we still, even with the, the dismal reports, the negative press, seen a, a record fall for my business with nearly 450 people taken down the river this fall. In the months alone of, of October and September, or excuse me, October and November, we also seen record numbers for September. Um, there seems to be a real draw to the area, I think, for a wide range of reasons. These amazing fish right there at the top of the list but the experience the journey the the whole the whole ability to be out on the wild salmon river is is something special and there's a real need for it right now in our our society and it's and it's showing up in dollars and booked motel rooms and busy outfitters and, and we're seeing that right now like we've never seen before so chris uh you know, Roy brings up uh, booked trips and then booked hotel rooms. And so in 2019, um, we saw the closure of the Clearwater River that really severely impacted the, 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 the recreational based tourism that Orofino in Clearwater County so depends on. Um, do you have a sense for what that meant for a, a loss of income for that, that industry, the, the hotel industry there in, uh, in Orofino? Yeah, fortunately we do. Um, we worked with uh, the Department of Labor Regional Economist and identified using uh, fish and game uh, English survey data from 2003 and 11 and projected that forward um, to the impacts of 2019. And uh, we were able to generate um, data showing that fishermen on average spent $308 a day and um, there were about 100,000 day trips in the season that were lost. So it equated to about a $31 million loss in economic revenue in the community. And that was to outfitters, to hoteliers, and the restaurants and industries that support them. Uh, so, you know, there are 247 direct jobs in Clearwater County alone uh, that are related and tied to recreation. Um, and so the the, the closure of that season had a significant impact. One hotel in particular, 70% uh, of their bookings uh, were lost as a result of that closure. So we're very aggressive and try to be proactive in sharing information with regulatory agencies around the economic impact in our rural community of the decisions that they make around fishing seasons. Yeah, and, and, you know, and that, you know, is partly why we as an organization at Trout Unlimited has focused on recovering these species. Um, I think it's important to note to uh, anybody that's tuning in tonight that uh, these fisheries that we are talking about are specifically open to hatchery produced um, salmon and steelhead. And, and we're mainly focusing on steelhead just because it's, it's that time of the year. But Mark, let's transition to you. 
Um, NRS is a, a, a national and, and international leader in, in uh, rafting and, and whitewater supplies. Um, and so here we have, you know, we are already, I think the three of us can say blessed to um, live and recreate in, in Idaho with um, an outsized number of, of free flowing uh, river opportunities. And so um, let's transition to that lower snake section and, and, and talk about that 140 miles and, you know, what that means to a recreational economy and, and an industry like NRS's. Yeah, well, I think it means a lot if any of you have had an opportunity to see um, photographs of, of what that river looked like um, before the dams. It's extremely profound. Um, I've seen um, images of, you know, downtown Lewiston, Clarkston, Idaho, where the snake flows through there and, um, you know, there are white sand beaches and people playing volleyball on them. Uh, there's something like um, close to 70 named um, whitewater rapids that are buried under those reservoirs right now. Um, there is a treasure under those reservoirs that uh, most of us, you know, have never in our lifetimes had the opportunity to see. Um, and, you know, I think it's pretty exciting to think about, you know, what kind of, of recreational economy um, we could bring back to this region um, with that river flowing free, um, not just for um, you know, the recreational um, opportunities that the you know, free flowing river would provide in terms of you know, rafting and kayaking, um, which are great, um, but also you know, our business, um, you know, in addition to, to whitewater, um, we, you know, do a, a very large part of our business is serving um, outfitters and guides, including um, fishing outfitters and guides um, like Roy here. Um, and so, um, you know, bringing back that river, you know, bringing back those rapids, those beaches um, and the fish, um, I and mean, we're talking um, with the fish alone, you know, estimates are, you know, um, for Idaho only, you know, upwards of $500 million a year in economic impact um, by, you know, bringing anglers to the region, um, you know, bringing, you know, Washington and Oregon, and, and that's well up into the billions um, per year. Um, and yeah, in, then in the summer months, you know, having people on those rivers, um, if any of you have driven between Clarkston and Heller Bar, say on, on the Snake River um, in the summer and seeing, you know, how many people are recreating on those beaches along that stretch of, of highway, it's crazy. Um, you open up, you know, 100 plus miles of that um, and it's going to be bonkers. Um, and so I just think we have a, a tremendous opportunity here to, um, you know, not only um, save you know these fish from potential um, extinction which is a, a permanent damage that we'll never recover from um, but also do it in a way that that brings jobs brings revenue to the region thanks mark so roy um you know we're talking about 140 miles of of river reservoir right now that would be transitioned to a free-flowing river um, you spend a, a tremendous amount of time on the middle fork of the salmon. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, size wise, I think it, it, you know, it would definitely be, be different, but, um, you know, let, let, let's talk about that experience of, of a, what 150 mile float or 140 mile float means not only, you know, not only to, to the outfitting industry, but, but individuals. Um, you share the boat for several days with clients from all over the country and the world. And, 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 and what does that experience mean, do you see? It's, it's life-changing, Eric. And, and people, like I was saying in my earlier statement, are, are craving it more than ever. Uh, the realities are, though, is, you, you know, I completed. Um, my goal was when I started working on the middle fork of that river, if those were in the down that river, and I was able to unload that this summer. So it, it was something that at the beginning, I wasn't sure if I'd obtain, but we made it. And it's, uh, it's definitely one of the most important parts of my life. But the realities are is when I look back at my time there and 
the limited number of people that actually get to see that river just because of the remoteness, the, uh, the difficulty of how it's permitted, just the fact that it's only a limited number of folks that can, can be there at a lot of times. It's, you know, it's not that it limits that in access to it. You're fading you just a little bit, Roy. Just fading. Just, yeah, you're just fading out a little bit. Yeah, just the the uh, the audio part. Okay. Well, I, I I was trying to say that. There you go. A section of river like that is is amazing and magical and can change lives, but it's not available to everybody, and it's only available a limited time of the year. When we talked about the lower snake. That's a stretch of river that could be available to so many folks. And the fact that we're talking not terrible difficulty and, and rapids, we're talking a central location where a lot of folks can get to it, space and adequate room for thousands upon thousands of people to see it at water flows that will be perfect year round, except for maybe a short period in the spring. So I think the availability, the, uh, the power of, having a long stretch like that where folks can float that many days in a row to really feel the river magic makes it unique and maybe set aside on a, on a level all of its own. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, what's, that's, what's so attractive. And, and for those of you that uh, might not be river rats, um, what, what Roy is really referencing is the fact that much of our rivers out West are permitted. Um, you, you must draw a permit. And as we have, seen particularly with this resurgence to a connection with nature um, and outdoor recreation, um, application numbers have gone up and the odds of drawing have gone down. Um, there's only a few sections of river um, throughout the West that are still unpermitted that provide that, that type of experience. But, but Chris, I, I think it's, it's uh, let's transition to, um, you know, Orofino and Clearwater County um, are, are extremely rural. Um, much of this landscape that we're talking about on the Lower Snake is also rural. Um, there isn't a lot um, through that 140 mile section, but um, what towns are up on the rim of the, of the Lower Snake um, would fall into uh, kind of the same economies that we see in Clearwater County. And so um, do you have an idea or a percentage of what kind of uh, economic input the broader sense of, of the Clearwater River, the South Fork, the Locksaw, the Selway provide to uh, Clearwater County's economy? Well, uh, uh, the recreation component is about 13%. Uh, um, government is a huge uh, percent of the economy in these rural communities. And, um, and, and that's not gonna go away, that's gonna be enhanced. I mean, I think when you think about the, the natural resource management side of uh, when the, if and when the dams are breached, right, then there becomes all this opportunity to study and uh, to manage the natural resources. And the economy in Clearwater County is 37% revolves around natural resource management. And, um, and, and I think that that has an opportunity to grow. The other piece as I was listening to Roy talk and also Mark is, you know, the railroad runs all along that river system and, and the railroad will not, a, not only become a mechanism to transport the goods uh, and, and services, but also people, right? So there's a tremendous opportunity to build on that sector of recreation economy that we haven't seen. So today we see the big river boats, the big paddle, paddle wheel boats come up to Clarkston. Well, in the future, we could see awesome railroad cars, you know, of the, of the past uh, come up. There's a beautiful um, uh, engine and dinner suite and railroad car in St. Mary's that the BG and CM Railroad owns. And, you know, that could come down to the Clearwater anytime in the very near future. We've been talking to them about the opportunity from Lewiston upriver and the rafting, just the pleasure rafting, not the extreme stuff like what Mark does and, and what Roy enjoys, but I'm kind of the August gal, you know, when the river's low and I can get on my float with a few friends and have a girl trip. Well, we've seen the river just packed with folks doing that. I don't have a way to me measure that economic impact from them yet, but I made a note as we were talking that that's something that we need to do with our regional chambers and with the North Central Idaho Travel Association. I think they can become a very 
um, useful and relevant partner in capturing the economic impact of this kind of creation. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Mark, how about um, from an industry perspective? I mean, we we, um, we here in Moscow um, uh, are are the home of uh, NRS headquarters. But with that being said, Idaho is the home of um, the top three brands in in whitewater recreation: um, NRS, Moravia, and Air. Um, uh, and so, from that, you know, how do we see this 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 river transitioning in that industry? Um, and what do we see? Um, how does how that industry stand, stand a chance to, to gain? Well, like the fishing industry, um, we've seen a massive uptick in participation um, in, you know, in whitewater rafting, um, kayaking, stand-up paddling tubing, all of those activities um, since the pandemic began. Um, and, you know, our little um, retail store here in Moscow, um, you know, just what we see there. I mean, we've had, we've been open at this location since uh, late 2019. So basically, um, mostly during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we have, we have a guest book here. Um, we've had people from all 50 states in the store, they're coming to this region to go on the rivers. Um, and when they do, they stop by and they say hello and, um, you know, buy a t-shirt or a hat or, you know, a life jacket or a dry bag or whatever it is. Um, the, you know, we basically are at a point right now as a company where, and I'm sure Air and Moravia are in a similar situation where um, we can hardly build enough watercraft to supply demand. But these people all need to have somewhere to go. Um, we've seen, um, you know, Roy mentioned the Middle Fork, um, which is kind of the, I would say, the premier along, you know, along with the Selway, the Maine Salmon, you know, one of the premier multi-day um, rafting stretches in Idaho. Um, all of those are are permitted. Um, they're lottery permits. They're very difficult to draw. I've personally put in for all three of them every year for well over a decade and have never drawn one. Um, so that tells you something. Um, and now the, the applications for those are through the roof. Uh, meanwhile, you know, um, a resource like the lower salmon, you know, basically from Riggins um, down to the confluence with the snake, which is a, a self-issued permit stretch. Um, it's not a lottery. Um, it's like, you know, along with the Grand Ronde also, which is happens to be a, a major steelhead river as well. Um, you know, those are kind of the two non-permitted stretches. Hell's Canyon is permitted, but those non-permitted stretches or self-issued permit stretches have been really um, heavily, heavily used over the last couple of seasons. Um, it's kind of scary for someone like me who's, you know, used to going down those rivers and not seeing a ton of people to suddenly, um, you know, I floated 30 miles in a day once last summer, just trying to find a beach with nobody on it that I could camp on. Um, opening up another 140 miles of river, um, river that would be accessible to people who are maybe, you know, beginners to novices and, and not ready to run class four, you know, whitewater. Um, that's going to take a lot of that pressure off, off of those other rivers as well, which would be a huge bonus um, for all of us in, in the whitewater community um, and would just be a massive draw to the region. Um, I think it's, it's probably underestimated like um, how many people are coming to Idaho to, you know, the Northwest in general to recreate in this way. Um, and it's gone way, way up in the last couple of years, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. Let's open up some more opportunities. Yeah. I think real quickly, if you don't mind, I think yeah, that there's Chris. a tremendous opportunity for us to take advantage of, of those, those folks that don't have the, the skills, and we can bolster the, the guiding opportunities, the interpretive opportunities, the cultural resources, the, the, the mineral uh, the geology that's along the, those corridor, that corridor, river corridor. There's just tremendous resources that people are interested in learning about. And if, if you want to learn and have an experience, that's what's driving a billion, a two billion dollar economy in tourism in Idaho. And and I think that we can capture that. And 
And our role in economic development will be to foster those entrepreneurs and those innovators who have ideas of how we can then help them bolster their business to meet that customer demand and market that. Absolutely. And I would just add to that, like, you know, I, I've seen some you know, quotes in, in the newspaper and things about, you know, um, the recreational opportunities that the dams create. Um, I would call BS on that one. Um, if, if any of you have been down to, you know, the reservoirs in August um, or really any time of the year, you might see one or two power boats out there, but it's not like <laughs> people aren't flocking there um, to recreate. I, I can attest to that. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to counteract that a little bit because we've seen record uh, recreation participation on Dorshack uh, and do nothing but increase over the last three years to the point where campgrounds are booked through the week now, not just on weekends. Yeah, I'm talking specifically about the lower four Snake River dams. Yeah, and so Chris, you, br you brought up a really good, really good statistic there, $2 billion in, in economic contributions from um, outdoor recreation. And so that, that is a very broad spectrum of recreational opportunities. But um, this is for each of you, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll put maybe Roy on the spot here, um, since he, he is a city councilman in Riggins. Um, one thing that we commonly hear um, is that recreation really isn't uh, an economic driver, um, particularly in this state and by electeds. Um, it's just discounted as a significant contributor. Um, and so, Roy, how, how does that conversation go and how do we, how do we counteract that conversation? Um, I know dollars and cents mean everything. Um, but for some reason, it just uh, doesn't seem to rise um, to the top in, in acknowledgement. Well, it's it's unfortunate, and uh, even in a community like Riggins that completely relies on recreation to drive our economy, uh, from the summertime, uh, whitewater enthusiasts, including park and play boat kayakers, uh, the folks that come here to do sightseeing out of jet boat tours number of people that come here in the fall to fish and big game hunt. The uh, winter steelhead season, right back into the spring salmon season is, you know, the driving force of, of our economy and our livelihoods here. It's here, it's something we have, it's something we should cherish, build up and preserve. It's a, uh, an economy we can, we can count on right now when there's no other certainty that any industry is ever gonna come back into rural Idaho and, and give us all kinds of jobs and a, and a, and a clean place to live. So it's, it's unfortunate, but there is that dream out there that some will replace recreation. And that's great if it happens, but the realities are is we need to put all our efforts into building and preserving what we have. And something that I've always championed and a big part of that long list of volunteer jobs you read earlier that I have here at Riggins is that as a as a outfitter, as a river guide, I felt strongly since I moved here in 1995 that we had to start establishing ourselves as an industry into these communities. Uh, make sure they knew we were here to raise our families, to volunteer, to participate to help our communities grow and thrive and we're not just here for a few months out of the season to take uh, what we can and leave sit on the bar stool use the laundry mat and, and are gone so I've never said no I've always pitched in 110 percent to make sure that folks realize our industry is viable that we're committed and that we are part of these communities and I and I've seen that starting to grow I've seen that transition when i first moved to riggins it wasn't too far from us being a, a mill town a timber industry community for 60 plus years and when our mill burned it looked like this town could dry up and possibly go away it was a hard transition but slowly but surely recreation proved its worth and now is the mainstay of our community at this point and and i really feel that it's a, a commitment that needs to be made by everybody in the industry to make sure that for whatever reason, because it looks like we're having so much fun that people realize it's, it's true work and that we're committed and we're here to make our communities better and make them withstand the test of time. Yeah, and Chris, let's hear your perspective on that being, um, 
you know, you, you, Clearwater County has seen the ebb and flow, particularly in the in the timber industry, and and really has seen, um, at least from my perspective, um, uh, a pretty significant growth in in recreation. Um, you know, and, and and so how does that translate in, in you know central Idaho um, uh, elected official conversations and and their acknowledgement of the contributions that the Clearwater um, and at some point in time, you know, that same conversation can be had by, by officials down, down river on the lower snake. What, what are you seeing in Clearwater County? Uh, I saw uh, an incredible eye opening uh, and awareness uh, improvement in the county commissioners when we shared with them around the Idaho Fish and Game permitting, uh, steelhead season permitting issue, where we were uh, getting information and data and presenting and, and engaging with um, National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, of the economic impact. Uh, their, their focus um, has been on sort of uh, ATV, motorized recreation, uh, Dwarshack gets a big focus in Clearwater County, the management of the water uh, and, and the release of the water to help the fish uh, flow downstream. And, you know, we've, we've mitigated that amongst the community in the early 2000s, there was a lot of frustration and anger and, and now people have really flipped over and see the value of the entire system and how we contribute to that in a variety of ways. I, I think um, to Roy's point, you know, fishing is a component within our community around recreation, um, but we've diversified uh, recreation approaches. And I think that's what we need to look at as we think about a strategy and a diversification seeds that we can plant along the Snake River um, pathway. Um, it, as, as we move and look at communicating with communities and uh, interest groups and advocates around how do we make this positive change, right? Um, directly in Clearwater County, uh, excuse me as I look at my note, but um, for we have 24 outfitter and guide direct related jobs. Um, when, again, when we compare that with the uh, 300 and some jobs that are around fish management between US Fish and Wildlife Service the Nez Perce tribe in the state, um, and then all of the habitat managers in relationship to water quality and the forest service, which feed our river system. Um, I think that we, we have to really look at that in, entire picture and the complexity of that in relationship to it. But um, again, your point about recreation, the, the commissioners typically have not been aware um, but when issues come up and we can share with them, that, hey, you know what? Steelhead fishing contributes $30 million to the Clearwater County economy. They start paying attention. Yeah, and Mark, how about you from an industry perspective? I mean, I think it's uh, I, I, with retailers um, uh, carrying your products throughout the country, not just in Idaho, um, you know, there has to be a diversity of opinions of, of what these what, what this uh, recreation opportunity provides to each of those areas. And so um, as, as an industry representative, what, what kind of perspective do you have on that? And, and how do you counteract that, particularly with, with elected officials? So are you asking um, just about the spectrum of opinions on the lower snake in our yeah and our, you know uh, as yeah, yeah 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 so the lower snake and also the contributions that that you know somebody like nrs um one of the the larger employers in, in latah county here in idaho but then as that that transcends down through the rest of the the trickle down economy of of retailers and so forth um you know are you seeing a, a change in perspective i know living here in Moscow with you, um, NRS is a pretty big, big deal in town and, and what it contributes and how many people it employs. But how does that transition into this, into this idea of a free flowing snake? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, our, you know, for our own company, we've, you know, I think our thinking on this issue has evolved significantly just over the last five years. Um, I would say that um, as residents of this region as you know a business operating in this region i myself personally have you know have grown up in this region you know my television <laughs> has been fueled with um, power from these dams for my whole life um, 
And, you know, we have neighbors that barge their crops to market. Um, we have um, employees whose families, you know, are, are, you know, employed in agriculture in the region or, you know, timber and they're, uh, you know, shipping, you know, bogs um, and, you know, uh, timber products um, down the river as well. Um, we, so we're coming at this from a little bit different perspective than say, you know, some of the other, you know, you know, outdoor industry companies that, that are not coming from the region. Um, in no way have we ever, you know, just been like, hey, blow up the dams to hell with it. Um, because that's not good for us. It's not good for our neighbors. It's not good for our, our employees and their families. Um, and that's why Simpson's proposal um, strikes us as so reasonable, um, because it really does um, look out for the economic interests of, you know, all of the stakeholders on this issue. Um, and yeah, we've got um, customers, whether they're end consumers um, buying direct from NRS or retailers, outfitters. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, they run the gamut from, you know, um, bleeding heart liberals, you know, down with the dams to um, pretty conservative folks. Um, and, you know, so I think where we're at is, is just taking a very measured and practical approach to this issue, um, which I think Simpson also is, um, and doing our best to just try to um, build some, um, you know, to educate, to build some consensus, um, to try to drive some, you know, a groundswell of, of grassroots understanding and support um, for taking responsible measures um, to bring the fish back and bring the rivers back. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, you made a really good point there, Mark, and, and I think that uh, the four of us sitting here tonight um, on, on these computer screens, um, we are deeply invested in our communities. Um, you know, Mark brings up a really great point of, you know, wa not wanting to see any harm to, to their neighbors. Um, we at Trout Unlimited have that same stance. Um, I live here on Palouse. I know um, a, a bunch of farmers that rely on uh, uh, barging to get their commodities downriver. And by no means do I or Trout Unlimited want to see uh, harm done to our neighbors, both, uh, you know, your next door neighbor or, or the guy that owns the field behind my house or uh, that, that neighbor that lives down in Genesee or over on the Camas Prairie. And the same, you know, having sat on the governor's work group with Roy, um, I know that that's where Roy's stance is too. And so uh, we're coming up uh, pretty close to about 45 minutes. And so um, I guess let's, uh, uh, are there any other questions, um, Greg, that you saw that I haven't, that you haven't addressed in the, in the chat um, already? Um, if not, you know, uh, we can um, get to some, some closing comments, I guess. Eric, one question that I did answer that might be worth touching on is just um, talking a little bit about the, the um, river that was piece in the magazine, you know, which I yeah. think is a good, yeah, um, a lot of this week, we at Trout Unlimited are, are spending our time uh, celebrating and enhancing exposure to um, the most recent recent uh, uh, release of Trout Magazine, which was dedicated to the Lower Snake. Um, what Greg is referencing is an article by uh, um, Tom Reed, who uh, is uh, staff with Trout Unlimited um, and a very good author. Um, uh, the river that that was, um, Tom spent an inordinate amount of time researching and interviewing, um, and it really paints this picture, um, this beautiful picture of a river that was, and what people experienced before the dams went in, um, and post, uh, post what they, they experienced, losing entire homesteads and family farms to flooding water. Uh, not to mention the loss of cultural um, significant um, sites to the Nez Perce, uh, in addition to um, historical, historical social sites um, that they practiced uh, traditional hunting and gathering throughout the, the Lower Snake. Um, it really is a beautiful story. 
uh, the, the stories of fishing opportunity then are uh, unbelievable. Um, quite frankly, just unbelievable to know um, how uh, abundant, um, particularly steelhead in, in most of the story, story was. Um, and so you can find that at um, the TU Digital Magazine. Um, we'll put a link to that uh, there in the chat. But um, it really is an incredible story. And the whole issue is, is pretty incredible um, when you really start to read the stories and gain an appreciation for, for truly what was and what has been lost. But with the inspiration that what we can have in the future, if we put our collective minds and hearts um, behind Representative Simpson, engaging our own elected officials throughout the region and the country to do the right thing by um, Sam Nasilla and the Snake River Basin, uh, the rural communities throughout the basin, um, and none the least, the Nez Perce tribe and the treaties that they were promised would be upheld um, moving forward. So um, good point, Greg. Uh, Chris, do you have some, some closing some closing thoughts or comments of, yeah, of we can go and, and, and what, what potentials we have. Yeah, anybody who knows me always knows I have some sort of comment. Uh, so I think that, well, we need to look at this and embrace it as an economic adjustment, uh, a look to the future and, and a way to leverage resources that exist now, not adding any new dollars to the mix from government sources, but utilizing and leveraging the existing dollars to bolster infrastructures that can facilitate movement of commerce in cost-effective ways like we see today, generation of energy in ways that, we, um, that we're looking at changing across the country, across the globe now. Um, and, and I think that if we think about it as the, this adjustment or this shift and not such this massive change or, or a blow up, um, that I think that's really the more healthy way. And, and, and a business lesson is what is the, what is, what is the offer, what do you offer in your business plan that solves a, a, a pain, right? Or an issue or a challenge. And, and so, in, and how do you market that? And I think that that's what we need to do is sort of put a business plan scenario around this and, and present it throughout the entire system communities. Uh, and I think that's where we're gonna win is one brain at a time, one, one ecosystem at a time um, and, and shift the thought process around the status quo. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great thought and, and a great perspective. Roy, you have a, you have a, a closing thought? You know, I do. Uh... Being raised in Jerome, Idaho, only about three miles from the Snake River, uh, gives me kind of a, a special perspective because that's a part of the river that's been dammed for since the early 1900s. Um, lucky for me, I I was in a family that traveled to the Salmon River, and I had a concept of salmon and steelhead and and what their what their numbers were like historically, and I got to see those fish in the Salmon River still actively. So growing up in southern Idaho, I definitely grew up with a sense of, of longing and even maybe a sense that something had been taken away from me. And knowing that at one time you could have looked off the Prine Bridge between Jerome and Twin Falls, seen crystal clear water and, and Chinook swimming underneath that dam always made me have this sense of longing and this need to search. So I, I moved to the Salmon River in 95 for that reason. I've had a great 25 years here, um, but now that I have been here for 25 and lived on the largest tributary to the snake and seen it in its, all its glory and have seen our fisheries, especially our wild fish numbers continue to decline, I have this sense of urgency that we're gonna see the same thing happen to what happened to the Southern Idaho Snake River that I grew up on. And so, seeing Simpson's plan and the, this viable option to, to move us all forward, to have a chance to restore and regain some semblance of our, of our steelhead and salmon runs, it's never seemed more important to me. And I really truly believe that opening 140 miles of the, of the Snake River back to its former glory after all the hard work that river's done, being literally the workhorse of our state, with 15 major hydro sites and all the diversions, millions of acres of farmland that's been opened by its waters. 
uh, here's an opportunity to give just a little bit back and maintain some of its former glory. And it seems at the very least, all we can do for, for the Mighty Snake River is to give it this last hope of a section that's free flowing where people can ride its waters, see its rapids and, and see these amazing runs of fish come right back underneath them. So that's the reason that I'm involved in things like this and I'll never stop saying no and I'll be part to tell my little story from Riggins any chance I get. And I wanted to thank you again, Eric, for having us on board. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roy. And, and we'll continue to support those efforts every way we can. Mark? Yeah, and thank you as well for having, having me on. It's, it's great to participate in this with Roy and Chris. Um, you know, when Roy was swimming the river in 1995, I was a, a senior in high school in, in um, Eastern Washington, and I wrote my high school senior thesis on the impact of dams on salmon and steelhead. Um, naively thought at the time that, hey, this is gonna change any time now. This is crazy, this can't go on forever. Um, and here we are all those years later and, and we're still essentially having the same debate. Um, I think that as human animals, we're hardwired to fear the unknown. Um, we tend to um, overvalue um, the status quo and, and undervalue the potential rewards of disrupting that status quo. Um, in this case, I think we're greatly underestimating the risk of not doing anything about these dams. Um, you know, we're risking um, permanent, ex you know, permanent extinction of wild steelhead and, and salmon species. Um, you know, that's unrecoverable. Um, we're risking, you know, further economic hardship in already hard hit rural communities. I know it's been a boon with this kind of uptick in, in recreation that we've had recently, but that's a gift that fell out of the sky. And if we don't take steps right now to try to build the infrastructure to maintain that in the future, you know, that's, you know, we've had boom and bust economies before over and over and over again in this region, it'll happen again. Um, you know, we risk a chain reaction of species decline up and down the ecosystem. Um, those species are unrecoverable but nothing else we're talking about in this equation is unrecoverable. Energy is replaceable, transportation is replaceable, irrigation is replaceable. Stakeholders can be made whole with investments like Simpson is proposing. Um, I think what we need to do as, as advocates is help build public support um, for a free flowing lower snake. Right now, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in politics from the national level to the state level to our county and local level um, to a T, you know, with the exception of Mike Simpson, um, they're saying, hey, I'm interested in this. I think it's where we need to go, but I can't stick my neck out there. You know, my head will get chopped off. Um, I've got farmers in my district. I've got, you know, timber in my district, I've got the port in my district, whatever it is, um, we need to provide them the political cover to be able to get with um, a free flowing lower snake. Um, and that happens by spreading the word um, that happens with, you know, organizations like Trout Unlimited beating that drum. Um, but really, um, the, you know, the pro dam side, um, the status quo side um, is killing us in, in the court of public opinion right now. Um, and they have, you know, they have on their side that, you know, humans like the status quo and fear the unknown. Um, and it's pretty easy to gin that up and, and make people think that, you know, we're all gonna be going back to the dark ages if, if we lose these dams. Um, we need to get to work. Um, it's never ever gonna happen without a groundswell of public support. And that's where we come in. Thanks for that perspective, Mark. And, and I think that, that that really hits it out of the park as a closing comment. Um, if you haven't already um, taken a look at Representative Simpson's uh, Columbia Basin initiative, um, it's fairly easy to Google. Um, we can probably provide a link to it. Uh, it's very broad um, and it does cover all, all impacted um, industries and communities, including salmon and steelhead. Um, there is one thing for certain, though, and, and Representative Simpson reiterates this constantly, um, 
every time that I've heard him speak is that um, not even in the court of public opinion, but in the court, the legal system, time and time again, um, conservation uh, 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 groups that have filed suit against the federal government on behalf of salmon and steelhead, specifically Snake River Basin, each time that that, that has been litigated, um, environmental and conservation groups win um, in litigation. So um, there is currently a stay in litigation and a uh, momentary um, pause in, in any kind of legal action um, from uh, environmental groups against the federal court to look at some alternatives um, and put a pause on things as we wait for Governor Inslee and Senator Patty Murray to release uh, a potential um, option. Um, and so we'll, we'll see where that goes. But that's the important thing to understand. Um, right now we have a, the, the golden ticket. Um, Representative Simpson has served this up um, to the region as, a, as an opportunity to make all parties whole. Um, if it's decided by the courts, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. Um, and Salmon and Steel have, have continued to, to win. Um, if you'd like more information about the science and biology of recovering salmon and steelhead, visit tu.org forward slash lower snake. I want to thank our panelists, Chris, Roy, and Mark. Um, very much appreciate your perspectives, your contributions to um, salmon and steelhead in the Snake River Basin. And uh, I uh, wish you all a, a good evening. And uh, if you haven't um, already, um, go to that website, tu.org forward slash lower snake and uh, contact your congressional representative and senator and let them know that you support the removal of the four lower snake river dams. With that, good night all. Thanks everyone. Bye. See you around the campfire on the lower snake. Sounds good, Roy. <laughs>